Well, thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to uh, to read and discuss this paper. Um, and thank you for the for the presentation. It added a lot to the to the working paper I had uh, to to read. Um, so sorry for not being here. I'm uh, stuck in Toulouse, uh, but it's uh, a joy to join uh, this afternoon. Uh, so first, I want to start with a quick summary of uh, the paper and its contributions. Uh, so the the authors uh, ask a very simple but very complex question which is what has been, is, and will be the effects of short-term and, and medium-term weather variations on migration and conflicts. And they do so by looking at the past, the present, and the future. Uh, when they turn to the past, uh, they do so uh, using uh, motivating examples uh, in a narrative uh, fashion uh, of environmental shocks leading to migration and regime shifts, shifts. And when I say regime, I mean political regimes. Uh, and the examples span uh, millennia uh, BC to uh, the, the 90s. Then they turn to uh, the present and they uh, uh, do an empirical analysis to uncover a uh, weather migration relationship. Uh, and finally, they use that relationship in combination with IPCC temperature uh, trajectories uh, to, to see how uh, that could uh, both for the, for the future. And in brief, what they find is uh, they, uh, the paper highlights and, and actually confirms uh, the present and past influence of environmental fluctuations uh, on the stability of societies and uh, on migration, uh, thereby adding to a growing literature on, uh, on that uh, relationship. Uh, so that's a very precious uh, contribution. They... Um, when they turn to the future, they uh, project a decline in immigration stock uh, in the more moderate warming scenario, despite an increase in uh, tropical and arid uh, country-born uh, immigrants. Uh, and that's probably this, uh, this more moderate uh, increase is probably due to uh, the, the GDP explanation that uh, uh, was uh, provided earlier. I, I fully agree with that. Uh, and then in the more extreme warming, uh, you actually see an increase in, in global immigration, uh, immigrant stock. And finally, uh, the, the tipping point scenario is actually very exciting and uh, I hope it will, uh, it will uh, shape, to, um, shape up to, uh, very soon. Um, so first, um, turning to the discussion, I want to, uh, to uh, start with the past and, and inflict to you my, my own favorite uh, references for uh, past environmental shocks causing mayhem and uh, including migration and, and regime shifts. Uh, my absolute favorite is the year without a summer, which you may have heard of. Uh, it was caused uh, in uh, by the eruption of um, a very big volcano in in what is now Indonesia, Montambora. Uh, in uh, 1815, and uh, that released into the air a huge plume uh, of uh, particles uh, of various sorts, and uh, the explosion was so big that it obscured uh, the, the the skies for for a long uh, period, which led to uh, crop failures, uh, extremely poor weather uh, around the northern hemisphere. Uh, crop, the, transforming into crop failure and uh, social disasters uh, because of famines, uh, etc. Uh, and uh, that has been documented by by here. I have two references of uh, of historians and and natural uh, scientists who have uh, talked at length, uh, among others, uh, about that. And the reason why this uh, writing lady is here is because this. Um, episode uh, pushed her and a bunch of her friends to a remote house uh, in, in Switzerland and the weather was so bad that they were stuck in there. Uh, and at some point somebody suggested writing ghost stories uh, to entertain one another and her story uh, eventually be became published uh, and it's uh, now now known as, as Frankenstein. And uh, this uh, all this to say that this dreary uh, weather uh, inspired her, but also caused a lot of other turmoil uh, in Europe, America, the Americas and, and elsewhere. Uh, and that had uh, various uh, far reaching consequences from uh, a series of famines 
uh, a book being written and with uh, cultural significance. Uh, but also it's alleged that uh, Napoleon's uh, demise was, was also caused by that. So I'll let you reflect on that. Uh, and um, the second one is, is way, clo way closer to us and is uh, alluded to in this uh, PNAS paper that I'm setting here, and it's the onset of the Syrian uh, civil war. And what the, the authors um, propose is that uh, it is the combination of a context, institutional context of the Assad regime um, failing in, in many dimensions uh, and uh, the uh, a series of droughts caused by climate change that together produced uh, uh, famines, crop failures, uh, internal migration, uh, unrest, and eventually uh, um, international migration. And they really emphasize this combination of institutional features, which were also present in the narratives that uh, uh, you had in the paper with uh, with climate uh, events. So I think that's a very nice uh, example for you. There, there are many others uh, that have been discussed in the literature, but I give those up to you for, for free if you want to use them. Um, now turning to uh, something that is more uh, uh, familiar to me because I'm not a historian is your empirical analysis. And uh, I'll start uh, very uh, directly with, uh, with, with questions. Uh, one is, um, I, it wasn't clear to me how uh, temperature was aggregated over space. Um, and um, given that you do a really good job uh, taking into account the the maize growing season in the in the time dimension, uh, I was wondering if you were uh, adopting the same treatment in space, which which was what we had done in the in the 2017 paper. Um, and then uh, as for your uh, dependent variable uh, immigrants. I was wondering whether that was uh, the the best uh, variable you could use here, uh, or if you were making your life uh, way harder by by using it. And what I mean by that is that uh, immigrants at any given time is 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 a stock. We typically don't think of of migrants uh, as a as a stock or seldom. Um, and you yourself, in in your first slide, referred to uh, recent immigration as a flow. Um, and so that's what uh, policymakers, um, people in the street will, will think uh, of it uh, as a flow. Um, and then the second, the second aspect, which is uh, more uh, technical, let's say, is that it's more complex to impact the evolution of a stock because there are many things that uh, play into it. There are, of course, the new people that migrate, uh, so that's the inflow. Then you have the, the existing stock of migrants. And then you have people who will leave the country, as you uh, alluded to. So, for instance, coming back from Indonesia to, uh, to the UK, but also will get naturalized uh, into their new country or die. Uh, and that's many things that will make the, the stock move. But you're, I, my sense is that you're more interested in the, the new people migrating in. Uh, and so the the question is, what exactly are we picking up when we're looking at the at the at the stock, uh, whereas the flow is a is a is a cleaner variable, uh, and that might just add noise, make your life more complicated, uh, and, and uh, that's that's why I would prefer going for a flow if you can uh, manage it. Um, and then the la the last point is that people. Uh, People change uh, countries for a variety of reasons. Uh, they uh, find work, uh, they uh, become a student, as I have been uh, a migrant myself. Uh, they uh, get married, they, uh, or they, they are desperate for uh, better economic opportunities or free civil war, etc. And uh, so these are all the people that are considered in, in your stock. Uh, and again, that makes uh, for uh, a more complex uh, group to unpack when you're probably just interested in a minority of those uh, of those people. Uh, second, uh, third uh, point uh, is uh, touching on on the GDP improvement uh, in your in your paper and uh, in 
in the narrative that you have around your empirical analysis, you emphasize the buffer effect that GDP can have. And I think that's probably very real, uh, that you can cope internally better if you have a, a higher uh, GDP level. But it could also be that uh, if you have a higher GDP per capita in a given country, you're less uh, exposed to, to shocks because you're uh, the share of your GDP that is coming from uh, agriculture and the share of your um, population that is involved in agriculture is smaller. And I didn't see too much uh, of that uh, explanation in the, in, in the discussion. Uh, the, the second aspect of the, of the GDP variable is that uh, even though in the, in the past segments of the, of the paper, you seem to allude to the fact that weather affects uh, GDP. Um, it doesn't seem to transpire in the in the empirical analysis. So what I call the present and and future uh, segments, and uh, in the present that causes that causes an empirical problem because then you have weather affecting two variables in your in your equation, and then GDP affecting possibly uh, possibly uh, migration in in return. Um, and then you have this problem per, uh, 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 rippling into your your uh, um, uh, projections into into the future, and uh, you've uh, suggested yourself uh, probably good fixes that will that will help uh, dampen that in the in the projections. But I would suggest taking a serious look at it in the in the present uh, regressions. Um, and then finally uh, the. That's uh, my last uh, my last annoying uh, comment on the on the empirics. I was wondering whether, uh, especially given the the the, uh, the picture you've painted of the drastic changes that were about to come, uh, and the uh, especially with the graph that I didn't have on on Amok, uh, I was wondering whether those short term somewhat moderate variations in temperature and precipitations that you use in the regression suited to model the reactions to the absolutely brutal changes uh, that an amok uh, collapse might bring about. Uh, as uh, the, the drop was very brutal, the magnitude was immensely steep. Uh, and uh, I wonder whether those uh, small year to year changes uh, in temperature uh, that were on, in addition uh, reversible from year to year uh, are, are suited to to model the the reaction of uh, farming systems and further societies to such a brutal change. Uh, so I'll uh, I'll conclude not to go over uh, too much. Uh, ov overall, uh, the this paper is uh, ambitious and ha and addresses an important issue uh, from multiple angles. Uh, it's uh, in my view, it's uh, the first part is makes an original use of a narrative approach as motivation or uh, literature review. Um, the the empirical approach uh, confirms uh, our results, which is always uh, heart forming with uh, very different data. Uh, so the migration, uh, the migration part, of course, but I, we didn't discuss the, the weather, uh, but that's, uh, so that's always a good thing. Uh, and you test the mediating effects of GDP uh, with, with caveats, but that's, uh, that's a very interesting addition. And so I have a few uh, additional suggestions for, uh, to improve the contributions that uh, are already clear. Maybe you could, uh, Streamline the narratives. Uh, in the presentation, you showed us a map, and that's extremely helpful uh, to uh, get or wrap our head around uh, the various peoples that are involved and how they are uh, connected together in space. Uh, and maybe um, you could substitute certain case studies uh, for others that would be more connected with the variables of interest. So, for instance, uh, the the Bangladesh one uh, talks uh, about uh, what I would classify as a as a natural disaster rather than uh, a weather shock uh, as you uh, measure it in the in the empirical part so maybe you could find something that uh, more closely connects to uh, to your uh, variables um, in the regressions uh, maybe rather than normalizing by the um, 
T0 uh, uh, emigration, uh, we're normalized by population and account for population growth in the extrapolations, uh, maybe that seems more natural. Uh, the one other suggestion I have is maybe you could uh, make uh, a greater use of your five year time step. I know you're limited because the five year uh, time step in the migration data prevents you from, uh, have, well, makes you run out of power very quickly, but uh, maybe you could try different transformations of the of the temperature variables uh, within that constraint of uh, only uh, seven uh, years uh, of, of data. Um, contrary to you, my preferred a regression specification is in column four, uh, so you should keep the, the the precipitation variables, and I think Max uh, will explain over uh, dinner if if useful. Uh, and um, uh, last uh, two points: uh, if uh, if you want to account for the the possibility of uh, uh, of that channel that I mentioned of weather directly affecting GDP, but still want to account for for GDP, maybe you could use the GDP at the beginning of the of your time series uh, to avoid this uh, this uh, uh, endogeneity problem uh, later on. Uh, and then uh, last uh, last point, I'm really excited about the mock collapse scenario and really curious to see how how you go about it uh, and to. To conclude uh, more, more to take a step back. Um, I so I again I think this is very valuable work. Um, I think uh, that uh, we agree on history being a very good guide, uh, and that uh, the with many caveats that the changes in temperature and climate that were experienced then that we will experience in the future are very different but also that our societies are, are very different uh, for better or worse. Uh, we're more connected, we have different technology, and that might either uh, amplify the effects or dampen them. And uh, the, the question is really open. So uh, the, the work uh, that continues in that uh, literature is immensely precious. And with that, I'll just um, stop here and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anuch. So I think we are a little past, over, uh, we are over time, but still we, we are going to have a, a couple of questions. So, uh, Klaus. Great paper, Elias and co-authors. Uh, f fun to listen to you, uh, to your presentation. Um, I'm as puzzled as you are by uh, the result of the relatively low numbers of 60 million going into future. Probably um, it's because you take literally your coefficients estimates. Um, and those are probably small because of what you explained, because the nonlinearity is the exponential growth and migration only comes into the future, not uh, in the current data. Having said that, however, I, I also would comment something which may even um, reduce the magnitude of your coefficient estimates of emigration stock to temperature, which is controlling for a host, I'm sure you thought about that, May, maybe you discarded these other variables, a host of other variables which economists of migration identify since George Borjas sort of founded this, um, this um, subfield of economics in the late 80s, early 90s, meaning things like um, uh, uh, not only the GDP difference between the two countries where they migrate from, but also the opportunities to find a job, uh, the type of policies which are, um, which are imposed in order to curtail or not illegal immigration. Um, maybe you, you have no data to distinguish between the stock of legal and illegal migrants because the illegal ones get legal after some years. And then geography, you have very, very uh, little um, uh, illegal immigration into island countries like, let's say, New Zealand or Australia, by definition, because they are islands. Um, so if you control for all of that, and other variables identified by George Borjas and others, 
Um, maybe your coefficient size, depending on the correlation betwe between, between your temperature and other omitted variables, if positive or negative, you might have even smaller coefficients. Um, but um, I think it's something which is worthwhile. Uh, Felipe and, sorry, Guillermo, thank you. Thank you, Elias, for the presentation. Uh, it's somehow related to Klaus's comment, because I was thinking that colonialism links between countries could reduce somehow the frictions of migration. And somehow the pattern of colonialism also coincides with uh, countries in cold regions colonizing countries in uh, warmer regions. So I'm thinking of the flow of migrants from India to UK or to England that is somehow reduced by the fact that they share some cultural elements after uh, many years of colonialism. Uh, I don't know if that's uh, controlled in your uh, estimation or if you have the data uh, that is disaggregated enough to do something like that. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, and Marshall. <laughs> okay. the last question. so uh, I have a question which was also for Marshall. Uh, you didn't see me in the first uh, session, but um, I wonder to what extent, I mean, there's another source of nonlinearity, I think. Uh, and I wonder whether you skip that or eventually you eventually have, may have some information. Is the issue of individual rationality? So we used to think of rationality in, 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 in a kind of game theory approach uh, as a kind of planning over a certain horizon. But if that horizon suddenly collapses, and for reasons which are attributed to anthropogenic action, my feeling is that the, the individual uh, rational reaction to that process is very unknown and probably very nonlinear. So I would like a some reflection on that. Marta. Thanks for the great talk. I love the historical examples too. The, those are super interesting. I, I wonder if the framing though in the modern era is, is somewhat different. I mean, do we think of, uh, your framing is, I would say, a bit negative uh, in thinking about all this potential migration as a problem, but what if we think of it as adaptation and instead of thinking about how to mitigate migration, which I think was your sort of policy implication, we think about how to enable it and work out the politics and allow people who are in really tough places to live, an, you know, another opportunity, treat it like adaptation. Ernesto, quick question. Super quick. Uh, shall we think about uh, migrants as, uh, so the welfare cost of migrants as a lower bound for the welfare cost of stayers? As migration probably is a way to try to um, not get much affected as uh, those who are not, have not the capacity to migrate and therefore has to bear all the, all the cost. All right, so there's a lot of uh, things to answer. First, uh, Anush, uh, thank you very much for, the, for those uh, thoughtful uh, comments. Uh, there's a lot to unpack in your, in your, uh, in your comments, so I'll just uh, take a shot at the, at the easy ones <laughs> and uh, you allow me some time to think about the more um, challenging ones. So uh, quickly, how temperature was aggregated uh, so basically, we take the, uh, for each country, for each year, we take the uh, average temperature for the whole country uh, during the maize growing season, okay? Um, and that's for one year, and then we average for a five-year period to match the, the way the other data is, is, is packed. Uh, there are extensions that we, we, we have thought of, we didn't have time to do, for example, not all countries grow maize as the main crop, so we could do with different crops that I think will lead to a more precise estimation of what's relevant for a country, for instance. So that's, that's one, one thing that we, we could do as well. Uh, you made a, a, an important point on, on stocks versus flows. Uh, we've tried different uh, specifications, but I think this is a point well taken. We should think, about, uh, should think more about this. 
And also uh, ask ourselves whether the sensual data that we're using uh, may hold, may have some at least partial answers to some of the questions. Maybe we could uh, exploit the fact that, that this uh, data is sensual and, 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 uh, and uh, perhaps uh, get a little bit more light on, on some of the questions that you raised. But the, the point is well taken and, and I think we should uh, test the robustness of this to alternative uh, specifications. Um, so uh, I'm, if I, th if I, I think if, if I understood your, your question about GDP, I mean, we're using GDP essentially as a proxy of, I mean, it's a broad proxy of uh, maybe institutions, the capacity of a country to adapt. So it's a, you know, it's a bunch of things that are summarized in, in GDP. Um, when Tama Cardo was presenting, I was thinking, uh, wow, that would be a great data set to get a hands on because that's a direct estimation on the cost of adaptation. So maybe we could add that directly and then GDP would play an, a different role and then we'll have the variable of uh, capacity of adaptation as an explicit one. But that's something that we can also uh, work on. But that's essentially the, 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 the reason why GDP is, is there as a control. Um, uh, let me let me turn to some some of the questions of the audience. Uh, so, Klaus, I uh, yes, uh, we share the puzzle of the small numbers, but uh, we I think we have an intuition for why this is so. Uh, your point on uh, controlling for other things uh, that uh, that contribute to migration. I think that that's a great suggestion, but that uh, does have some um, some complications because then you you enter into the you know the Cambridge causality police uh, issue, right? Because uh, many of these uh, elements are not uh, variables are not uh, completely exogenous, as is climate. Right? So climate, it's def that's the one thing about doing climate studies that climate change is, is exogenous for the country. Uh, but still, I think we could do a, an effort in, into, into uh, exploring other uh, covariates that explain in, in the work that you cite uh, migration. Uh, and I'm not sure actually if the, the results would get smaller. Maybe they'll get bigger because uh, we would e estimate the regression more precisely. We are trying to estimate the relation between climate and mi migration. And maybe we are confounding with a bunch of other things that are causing migration that are not related to climate, and that probably just add noise. So I, I'm, I'm not sure in w which direction it will play out, but that's something certainly to uh, think about. So uh, F Felipe, I'm not sure if I un understood your point. I mean, uh, we, we uh, and I wasn't very clear uh, in this in the presentation, but the, the um, source of the data is basically country to country. So uh, again, uh, the, amount, the amount of people uh, um, born in Zimbabwe that are living in all the different countries of the world. Okay, that, that's how the, the, the data is set up. And then we run uh, these regressions uh, and then you can uh, aggregate them to the level that you want. Uh, we have not tested if there's any uh, relationship within, uh, between the uh, colonial uh, relationships. I think that was your point. Uh, that's perhaps something that we could do. Uh, we, we didn't do that explicitly. Um, Guillermo, the, the, the point you raised on, on, uh, on, uh, on uh, non-linearities about individual rationality, I, I fully agree with you. And uh, actually, I was, I'm always surprised by these uh, uh, studies on migration that show a surprising resilience of people to stay in, in the places that are affected by a storm, and then another storm, and then another storm, and they, they kind of stay. And uh, there's a lot of uh, um, um, empirical work that's uh, more uh, sort of a, of a survey nature. So people go, you know, and they survey uh, households, and they ask them, you know, why do you remain here? And it has to do with what you said, social ties, you know, living, it's, it's hard. Uh, you know, poor people have, they don't have resources to live. Uh, but I agree with you. I mean, when the future becomes the present and there's nothing left to grow, then uh, all these plans and all these uh, social ties basically go out the window and people just have to move. And I think that's where the non-linearity really kicks in. 
And my suspicion is that in the data, it has kicked in in only very modest number of places. And uh, we will see more of this in the future. Uh, Marshall, I I'm actually positive about migration. I, I just read a book, I can't remember the author. Uh, Melissa, no, I, 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 don't, I don't remember the author, but it's a, it's a great book that basically says the, the same point. I mean, migration is our main adaptation mechanism. I mean, it's, it's what gave us bipedalism, for Christ's sake. So, I mean, it's, it's clearly an adaptation mechanism. Uh, and I'm personally very positive about migration. But the problem is that I am in the minority, right? I mean, the, as things stand, countries that are receiving migrants, they do not have a, a positive uh, perception of this. I mean, we see this in Chile. We see this in the US, we see this in the UK, we see this I mean, everywhere you look. Maybe the first wave of migrants is not a big deal. The second wave of migrants, eh. Third wave, fourth wave, it's like, man, we don't want this anymore. And then we, we, we are seeing the, the political shifts that are coming. I mean, uh, uh, so that's why I also alluded in, in, in my last point. Uh, I mean, adaptation is important, but uh, migration is coming anyway. So we need to do something about it. And that's something about it. I think uh, it's not just trying to exogenously, uh, uh, or with some you know, uh, communication strategy, try to change the perception of people. Uh, I think it has a lot to do with making illegal migration legal. And that requires you know, international cooperation, uh, treaties on how to assign people that are leaving places that are in uninhabitable into different countries in an orderly fashion uh, that they get, you know, they get the proper visas, they get the proper work permits, and there you, then you incorporate them in society as opposed to becoming, you know, uh, soldiers in some narco uh, versus coalition versus another one, which is what is happening in Chile as well and in many other countries. So migrants are getting in anyway, and if they come illegally, they, of course, uh, uh, you know, they're going to have a much worse time and the receiving country is going to benefit a lot less from that migration and therefore, you know, it's sort of understandable why the perception is not, is not great. Uh, so that was the last point on, on you know, working on this uh, international cooperation for, for tackling this issue. Uh, and finally, Ernesto, uh, I, if I understood correctly, uh, so t uh, your idea is to, to somehow use the, the standard of, of living of uh, migrants in other places where they migrate to, to proxy for the cost of the people that are left behind? I don't no, know if I understood It's, it's that. a very simple point. It's, uh, correctly, but it's, uh, since migration is a way of adaptation, those who cannot migrate probably are doing even worse. That's all. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, no, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, I totally agree with that point. Um. Okay.